Okay, so the theme of the TED Talk is research and discovery, and that's what I do. I do research on black holes and discover new things about them. And to do that, I use instruments that fly in space. So uh, I have to use rockets. That means I'm a rocket scientist. <laughs> and yes, I did used to work for NASA. And uh, so in the words of the song, you're a rocket scientist. That don't impress me much. <laughs> but actually, it does impress me quite a lot, because it's not really what you might expect, given my background. Um, my parents were not rocket scientists. They didn't get the opportunity to go to university. How, how did I get to be one of the first professors in physics in the Durham Physics Department, one of the first women to be a professor in the Durham Physics Department? Well. Let me tell you a bit of a story then. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to me at 11. <laughs> so this is in the 70s. And the 70s, for those of us who remember them, wave at me if you remember the 70s. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, one of my biggest fears was I would stand here and you would all look at me. The 70s, you remember the 70s? They were a different country. The height of sophistication in the 70s was having French bread for tea <laughs> and knowing that it was called a baguette. The 70s, different country. And um, especially growing up in a small, slightly scruffy seaside town, um, excitement, entertainment, they were kind of hard to come by. So pretty much all there was was the TV and uh, one thing that did catch my imagination and my attention was Star Trek, to boldly go, to seek out new life and new civilizations. And they would have some exciting, exotic adventure every week. That was much more exciting than my life in the 70s in a scuffy seaside town. And uh, the thing that really caught my kind of imagination was their science officer, Mr. Spock. Every week, they'd go on some exotic adventure, generally involving a black hole, time travel, alternate universes, and generally, they'd land up in some sort of trouble, and generally, it was the science officer, Mr. Spock, who would understand what was going on and put it all together and rescue them. So I wanted to be Spock. <laughs> Maybe that's not a particularly normal thing to want, but let's not go there. So, I wanted to be the science person, the one who understood what was going on. But science, uh, to sort of teenagers, is maybe a little bit scary. What, what if I wasn't clever enough to do science? It has a reputation of being a bit difficult. What? So, why are we intimidated by it? And thinking about it, I think maybe, actually, it's to do with the fact that in science, there's a a right answer. That there is a right answer to the question 2 plus 2 equals. There is one right answer and an infinite number of wrong ones. So if you're guessing, the odds are not good. But if you actually understand what you're doing, then it's actually quite easy. But to build that understanding requires hard work. It requires consistent hard work. Sally Ord this morning was talking about Practice, practice. I find the more I practice, the luckier I get. And, um, uh, and that is something we, we actually understand. Uh, in Durham, in the physics department, we do quite a lot of outreach to local schools. And part of that is a series of Christmas lectures. And I was doing one of these at one point, and one of the teenagers stuck their hand up and said, um, how do I get to have your job? <laughs> and I'm thinking, you'd have to fight me for it. <laughs> And uh, I said, right, here's, here's what you do. You hand your homework in this week, and you hand it in again next week, and the week after, and the week after that. But there's this kind of consistent hard work that comes with building understanding. But once we've actually built that understanding, once we know the current knowledge, then it is that we get to be creative. Research in science is very creative. It's not just knowing and understanding things that are already known, 
but you have to know and understand those things to get you to the edge of current knowledge so that then you can look over and start to build something new, create something new. So let's give you an example of this from my field of black holes. Black holes are all about gravity, and gravity, well, 400 years ago, Isaac Newton actually did this amazing creative synthesis of two very different kind of things. An apple falling from a tree, the moon in orbit around the Earth. He took these two very different things and said, ah, they're part of the same thing. This is gravity at work, just in two very different situations. And he gave us ways of calculating the effects of gravity. But physics isn't just about being able to calculate what happens. Physics is about understanding why it happens. And so the more fundamental question is, what is gravity? And on that, Isaac Newton famously said, mm, I frame no hypothesis. Actually, he wrote it in Latin, but my Latin's not good enough. So in other words, having a clue, girls. And so that's what it was like for another 300 years till Einstein came along. And Einstein's gravity not just gave us a better way of calculating what gravity does, calculating the effects of gravity, though it does do that. Einstein's gravity gave us an answer to that more fundamental question. What is gravity? And in Einstein's gravity, there is an answer. Einstein goes, gravity is curved space-time. Think of the surface of space-time as kind of like a trampoline. With nothing on it, it's all nice and flat. If you roll a ball across that, then it will go in a straight line at a constant speed. Now stick some mass on it, and it bends it. And so anything that you roll across this surface, even though it kind of is going at a straight line, constant speed, if I'm an ant and I'm walking, left foot, right foot, middle foot, oh no, there are biologists in the audience, that's a bad plan. Ants don't really walk like that. Um, but if I'm an ant walking in a straight line at a constant speed on a surface that's curved, my path is going to look curved. It's going to look like there's some spooky action at a distance force dragging my path around. Actually, I'm just getting um, my path bent by the, the curvature of space-time under my feet. I'm walking in a natural way, but on a surface that's curved. And so that's the big idea. That's Einstein's gravity. And then to think about black holes, you want to make gravity really, really strong. And uh, so let's go back to this picture and uh, think about putting the sun there instead, because the sun's much more massive than the Earth, so it will bend space-time more. So let's do a cut-through of our space-time and stick the sun on it. That's this yellow thing here. And uh, the Earth is going around the sun. It's that... Uh, that green dot, and here's its orbit going around. So, how can I make gravity stronger? I could put yet more mass in that space, or I could squeeze the sun, make it smaller and smaller. Because what I'm doing here, I haven't changed the mass, but I've compressed it into a much smaller space. Nothing's happened at the orbit of the Earth, but I can now get to these regions of much more curved space-time down here. And if I squeeze the sun enough, I can make gravity strong enough, make the curvature of space-time strong enough, that not even light can get out. And at that point, where not even light can get out, that's the event horizon of a black hole. But you can see from this that, actually, the curvature of space-time round by the Earth has not changed. In other words, the Earth's orbit wouldn't change. So it's not like all those bad sci-fi movies where there's some inexorable cosmic vacuum cleaner <laughs> sucking everything in. Actually, the Earth's orbit would remain unchanged if the sun became a black hole, which it won't, but we'll get onto that in a second. Um, so nothing would happen apart from the fact that all the light would go out and so all the plants and animals would die and so we would die, but apart from such minor considerations, nothing would change. So that's then uh, another way to think about this event horizon is to think about it as being the point at which space-time itself is falling into the black hole at the speed of light. 
If I'm a, a swimmer swimming against a current, if my swim speed is faster than the current, I'll move forward. But if the current is faster than my fastest swim speed, even though I'm trying to swim forward, I'll get swept backwards. And the speed of light is the fastest thing there is. And so this event horizon marks the point where even light trying to swim forward is going to get swept backwards down into the black hole. So that's a quick rundown of what a black hole is. Uh, what would we need to do to make one? Well, we could take the sun and squash it into something the size of London or Newcastle. Seems a bit it's hard to imagine how big the sun is. Let's, let's start with the Earth instead. If I took the Earth and I squidged it down, squeeze, squeeze, <coughs> squeeze, to between my thumb and forefinger, take the Earth, put it between my thumb and forefinger, less than a, than a centimetre, then I'd have made gravity around it strong enough to make it an event horizon around a black hole. At which point you start thinking, ha, 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 that's not going to happen. That is impossible. You, I mean, how can you get such extreme compression? Not going to happen. Why are we even talking about this? Well, it won't happen to the Earth. It won't happen to the Sun. But for the most massive stars, then at the end of their life, once they've uh, got through all of their fuel, then they're a big star. There's a lot of gravity pushing in. And it was the pressure of the hot gas that was holding them up. And now we've run out of fuel, gravity never runs away. You get this dramatic implosion of the core. The outer layers bash into it, explode outwards. And you get these utterly dramatic supernova explosions where a single dying star for a couple of months can outshine an entire galaxy of 100,000 million stars. 100,000 million other stars, one dying star. Just for a couple of months, this supernova explosion can outshine a whole galaxy of stars. So the core compression you get in that, that'll make you a black hole according to what we know. So, how do we test this? There's a great quote from Red Dwarf about the thing about a black hole is its main distinguishing feature is it's black. And the thing about space, your basic space color, it's black. So how are you meant to see them? Looking for a black hole on the black background of space is a really daft idea. Not a good way to go. But there's a better way. Most stars are actually uh, not single stars like our sun. It's a bit of a Johnny no friends. Um, but most stars hang out with their friends. So if one of them uh, becomes a supernovae and becomes a black hole, its friend can be lunch. And uh, the outer layers of the star can fall towards the black hole. And as they fall towards the black hole, as they make a, a disk, uh, this disk heats up. There's enormous amounts of gravitational energy that heats up this material, not to red hot or even white hot, but to X-ray hot. And uh, so you can have this X-ray hot, intensely bright disk of material spiraling in towards the event horizon. It's like the last scream of the material before it sweeps down below the event horizon and is lost to the universe forever. So let's look at the sky with X-ray eyes. But that's a problem, because X-rays, which have very, very short wavelength, do not get through our atmosphere. So if I set up an X-ray telescope and try and look at the sky, hmm, nothing. No X-rays get through our atmosphere. So that means you have to go above our atmosphere, and that means you get to play with rockets. Oh, what a shame. So, in the early 60s, when um, the rocket program was starting to uh, get out of complete military control, uh, Giacconi decided he'd put little X-ray detectors. He, he didn't know what he was looking for. He thought, hmm, it'd just be cool to put an X-ray detector on a sounding rocket and see what we see. Uh, so he said, oh, maybe something from the sun or the moon. Yes, well... And what he actually found was that there were intensely bright X-ray sources all over the sky. Now, 
Um, there we go. And uh, so what he actually discovered was he discovered saucers with these X-ray bright disks of material falling down towards the black hole. So these X-ray detectors in space, they transformed black holes from being some kind of theoretical speculative extrapolation of Einstein's gravity to being observable science. So he got the Nobel Prize for that in 2002. But the other caveat is they turn it around and say, well, to study black holes and their effect on matter, you get to do rocket science. Ah, <laughs> such a shame. So let's look at the sky with X-ray eyes. This is a picture of the entire sky as seen in X-rays, and it's centered on the center of our galaxy. And there are these sources in red, they're all these kind of X-ray hot disks around these collapsed stars that are maybe 10 times as massive as the sun. But you can also see there's lots of blue points here all over the sky, scattered randomly. And these are um, supermassive black holes that lurk in the centers of galaxies. And where material falls onto those, you can get X-ray hot disks, X-ray bright disks around these black holes that are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. So that's kind of given you an overview of the kind of edge of what we currently know. So now we've got to the edge, we can look over. We kind of understand something about what happens when it's a disk of material around the black hole. But we know that it doesn't always look like that. And the times when it doesn't look like that, we don't really know what we're doing. And um, our kind of lack of understanding is highlighted most dramatically, I think, in sources like this. This is an entire galaxy of stars, 100,000 million stars, some like the sun, some a bit bigger, some a bit smaller. And down in the bottom there, there's a black hole, and material is falling onto it, liberating immense amounts of energy. But now, some of this energy is coming out in the form of these dramatic, relativistic jets. They're coming out at close to the speed of light, and they're traveling over enormous distances. And um, yeah, in terms of research, we don't really understand very much at all about this. This is the edge where we look over and try and build something creative. So what I want to leave you with is that research and discovery in science is a creative process, and it's very exciting. But it does require hard work. Um, but we know this in, in all kind of creative arts, dance, music, we know that it takes work. We know that it takes practice, 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 practice. And it's the same in physics. But the bottom line is, I get to do rocket science. I spend my days thinking about what happens to black holes. But I try and then put the creativity in, synthesizing data and models to try and build understanding, to try and build the next few footprints out past the edge of what we already know and understand. Thank you.